All right, hi, uh, Sydney and Araceli. I don't know if that's how you say your name, but welcome to both of you this evening. Um, you are welcome to turn your cameras on if you want to. Um, uh, you don't need to. I okay. am going to go ahead and mute. I'm going to mute both of you for now, um, but feel free to unmute yourself at any point if you have a question, okay? All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm going to share my screen with you um, so you can see the information that we're talking about here tonight. Okay, can you guys see my screen? The PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. All right, so um, welcome this evening. I'm really happy that we have a couple of you attending. So um, since this is a small crowd, feel free to um, interrupt at any time you have a question. Um, feel free to put some information or to ask some questions in the chat. Um, we'll be watching that as we go along. And so we really just want to know um, what you want to know. So we've obviously got some things prepared to present for you. Um, but if there's some specific, specific things that we don't cover that you want to know about and you have questions about, like I said, please stop us, ask anything you want to know at any time. This, this is for you guys. Um, so first, um, we're going to talk about the financial aid process tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to kind of walk you guys through that process. You're muted, Kristen. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, just kind of walk through what our office does and what all, as a student, what you, what you need to do. Um, first thing is we just determine what aid you're eligible for based on the information that you put on your FAFSA and then we award you that aid and then we apply the financial aid to your bursar account. And then there's um, two different ways that you can go fill out your FAFSA. There's um, an app, My Student Aid, and it's like Everyone says it's super easy, like super fast. Um, you can do that or you can just go online to fafsa.gov. And then if you're coming in the fall, next fall, you're gonna want to do the 2021-22 FAFSA. And that's been available since October 1st. And some of our stuff that we award is like a first come first serve kind of thing. So the sooner you get your FAFSA done and any you know, other requested documents, the better for you. And then our school code is on there, the 003161. You just enter that on the FAFSA. That way they send the FAFSA information to us so we can start working on your aid package. And you have to fill out the FAFSA every year. It's not a one and done kind of thing. It's um, October 1st. And then for the 21-22 year, you're going to use the 2019 tax information, even if that doesn't accurately reflect your current or your parents' current financial situation, um, still go ahead and fill out with the 2019 taxes. So Kristen, if they, like if their um, financial situation has changed kind of drastically, they can contact your office, right, and let you know that, hey, this really still doesn't reflect exactly what my family's um, financial situation is now, and then you guys can help them through that process? Right. They still have to fill it out with the 2019 taxes, but definitely contact our office and we can um, look at doing an income adjustment because lots of people incomes have changed this year. And then um, there's some questions on the FAFSA where you'll have to answer, you know, are you 24? Are you married? Do you have kids? Are you working on a master's? And unless you can answer yes to one of those questions, we have to have your parents' information on the FAFSA. Um, even if, you know, your parents don't claim you, you don't live at home, unless you can answer yes, we, we still have to consider you a dependent student for financial aid purposes. 
And then um, this is this is kind of like a screenshot of when you go to um, fsaid.ed.gov, you'll have to have the FSA ID in order to fill out and sign your FAFSA. And if you're a dependent student, then at least one of your parents will need one also. And you'll use the same, the same one for four years or four or five. Um, this is what it looks like when you go to fafsa.gov. And if you've never filled out a FAFSA before, you're gonna to go to the middle one where it says start here. And then that's when you'll enter the 20, uh, 2021, 22 and your FSA ID and, and that to log in. And if your parents are remarried, you'll have to include the step parents information also. They have that worded kind of weird, so. And then once you fill out all your demographic information and answer the yes, no questions, then it's gonna ask for your income information and you can do the, um, it's called the IRS data retrieval tool and it'll take you to a different website and it basically imports the information off of your taxes into your FAFSA. That way you don't have to worry about what line to fill out, you know, where are you getting this information from? It transfers most of the information to your FAFSA and it, you know, provides more accurate financial aid readings, financial aid information. It's just a whole lot easier if you can do it that way. But then they have different questions to see if you're eligible for it or not. And I would highly recommend doing that. Um, I filled out the FAFSA for my child over the last year. And believe me, it's much easier to just click that button and say, please find all that for me than try to go through your taxes and find the line that equals this and all that. Let this do it for you, believe me. Yeah. And that's what it looks like when you use the app. Um, the website's pretty similar. And then once you click on that, you want to use the data retrieval. The one on the left is what it looks like on the website. And then the one on the right is on the app. It's just letting you know that you're going to leave the FAFSA website and go to the IRS website. That way, you, you know, you know that's coming and you don't panic or anything. That way we can get your information transferred. And then that's another screen that um, you're going to see whenever, you know, it's just letting you know that this is right. This is where you're supposed to be going. So if you see that, then just, you know, click OK and keep on going. And then once you, it's trans, uh, transferred all of your information, you should get something that looks like this that says your information successfully transferred. And um, it's not going to have the numbers in there for you, but it's we'll be able to see them like what's been transferred. And then um, at the very end, when you hit submit, you're gonna get something basically that looks like that. And then they send the information to the school. And if we need any additional information, we send everything to your NSU email account. Like um, if we need additional verification documents, whenever you're awarded, just constantly check the NSU email account. So that's something really important um, that after you after students apply and get admitted when you get um, your application packet or your acceptance packet in the mail uh, you get kind of like a folder of information and there's a lot of stuff in it but it's all really important and so one of the things that's in there is how to set up your nsu email account uh, and so you're going to get a lot of notifications in that email when you're a student but this is the very first thing and the most important thing and the most important reason you need to set that up early is that everything from the financial aid office is going to come to that NSU email. Um, so it's really, really important that you start checking that uh, because you a lot of times you're going to need some additional information for financial aid and you may not know that if you're not checking your NSU email. Yeah, check it, check it, check it. <laughs> <laughs> check it again. <laughs> yeah, and then in order to keep your um, financial aid eligibility, you do have to pass at least 67% um, of the courses that you attempt, and that's cumulative. And you also have to have at least a 2.0, but for freshmen, it's 1.7. And then um, some majors have different GPA requirements. Um, 
And that's just letting you know, you know, graduate in a timely manner. And then that um, if you withdraw, uh, you know, depending on when you withdraw in a semester, you may have to repay a portion or all of the aid. And then that could, you know, put your future jeopardy or sorry, your future aid in, in jeopardy. So it's just kind of like keep an eye on that kind of thing. So if there's ever a semester that you're thinking, oh, I, I think I need to withdraw from this class or something like that, that's okay. A lot of students, you may need to do that at some point in your whole college career, but it's always a good idea just to stop by the financial aid office, give them a call and say, hey, I think I need to withdraw from this class. Tell me how this is going to affect my financial aid eligibility. Just have that conversation with financial aid, even your advisor before you do that, just so you can have a clear picture of, of what that um, may affect before you do it. Yeah, definitely. And then like once all this is said and done, um, you know, we have your FAFSA, you've been awarded, um, you're going to have to fill out the FERPA. It's that way, like, you know, your parent or spouse or somebody want to call and get information on your account. We can't tell them anything unless this has been released. Like we can't even tell them we have your FAFSA, we need this, we need that. We can't release any information until we have this. Like it says, we can answer, you know, general questions, but nothing specific. So it's very important. And that's for not just our office, that's for lots of other offices on campus. Would like to interject here real quick too, that when my son initially enrolled in college, he was 17 and he was required to turn in my tax paperwork. And so I called the office and was like, um, this kid um, loses his phone every three or four days. So I don't really want to do that. And they're like, well, unfortunately, unless um, the prep is filled out, you, there's nothing you can do. And I was like, well, he's a minor. And they're like, doesn't matter. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so then I asked him to go ahead and do that. So if you are 17 year old, years old coming into school, same thing would apply. They can't talk to your parents unless you have filled that out because you are seen as an adult. Um, in the college realm already just by enrolling. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of parents say, well, I'm paying for it. You can tell me. I can't tell you anything without that fur bond file. Yeah. And you can also pick in there too, um, you know, if you want your parents to be able to help you with your financial aid process and give them access to that, but not give them access to your grades, <laughs> you can kind of pick and choose what you want them to do. But it is re a really important thing um, that you do need to make sure that you fill out if you um, want your parents to be able to call and, and ask questions for you. And you can withdraw your FERPA as well. Yeah. So if at any point, you know, you're starting to take over more of your financial uh, independence and you decide your parents don't need to be a part of that anymore, you can withdraw that. So you, they don't have to have access until you're 22, 23 years old. That's entirely up to you. And then here's our contact information. We are, um, you can always call, email, stop by. Um, we're the little red brick building in the middle of campus in between Seminary Hall and the library. But um, yeah, if you have any questions whatsoever, please, please don't hesitate to ask us. You guys have any questions? Yeah, if you have any questions about financial aid right now, um, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and ask. Um, we're going to let Kristen log off the call um, and not stay on the whole time. So if you've got some questions, please ask them now. You guys are good? Well, if you think of anything later, contact our office. All right. Thank you, Kristen, for sharing that information. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, we are going to move on to some scholarship information. Um, and that's me. I should have introduced myself at the beginning, but I didn't. I forgot, So, <laughs> which I usually do. But anyway, my name is Jessica Langston, and I'm the Associate Director of Recruitment and Scholarship. So I play a couple of different roles, but um, scholarship is what I'm going to talk to you about at this point. So um, I should have asked, um, are, you guys can use like your little um, reaction buttons or whatever, but are both of you um, seniors in high school this year? Maybe? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Have you, have you guys applied for scholarships or anything yet? 
Um, I've tried to apply to some, but I like my computer messed up for a little bit. And so I had to like restart on all of them. So gotcha. Okay. Well, I'm going to walk through the process of scholarships for you here um, and, so, and tell you a little bit about these. So what's on the screen right now is um, our general freshman tuition waiver scholarships. And so a tuition waiver is the type of scholarship and what it, it does exactly what it says it's going to do. It's going to waive a certain part of your tuition. So it's not like cash money um, that's going to apply to anything or that you get a refund from or anything but it will apply directly to tuition that you have been charged. So we'll just look at the top line here as an easy example of what I'm talking about. So um, hopefully you all have taken your ACT already. So you can kind of look and see um, where you might fall. When we look at scholarship eligibility, we're going to look at both your ACT score. So we're going to look at your highest composite score that you've taken or that you've earned and then your unweighted GPA. So some schools will have two different GPAs, a weighted, which is based on a five point scale. So some schools, if you take honors classes, um, they may rank you on a five point scale, but then all schools always still have an unweighted GPA based on a 4.0 GPA. So that's what we're gonna look at for both admission and for scholarships. So again, back to our example here, the collegiate scholarship, you've earned a 26 or higher on your ACT and a 3.5 unweighted GPA, this dollar amount right here is per year for four years when you look at this duration right here, and this is the deadline. So you can kind of take a look at all of our scholarships here and see what you would need to be eligible. Um, when you do apply for scholarships, you have to be admitted to NSU before you before I'll look at your scholarship application. So that doesn't mean you have to wait to be admitted. You can apply for admission and scholarships on the same day, that's fine. Um, but I won't look at your scholarship application again until you're admitted. And that's just because I share um, your academic information like your transcripts and your ACT score with the admissions office. Um, so that's kind of your first step there. Um, with admission, um, we didn't really plan to go all the way through the admission process with you tonight, but again, later on, if you all have questions about that, we'll certainly go through that with you. Um, but to be admitted, um, our general admission requirements are either a 20 on the ACT, um, or if you've taken the SAT, we'll convert that in, I think it's a 1030 um, ACT score to be admitted. And then, um, or we can also admit you on your GPA, so a 2.7 and be in the top half of your class. We do have to have um, both your, you do have to always take your ACT, even if you don't have that 20 on your ACT and we're going to admit you with your GPA. We've got to have ACT and GPA in order to admit you. So you've got to take um, either the ACT or SAT to be admitted. The final thing on the bottom here is this foundation scholarship line that says it all varies. And so when you fill out our general freshman scholarship application, you're applying for all of this stuff. Our foundation scholarships are privately funded scholarships. There's hundreds of them literally um, that are funded by private donations. Trace is cracking me up here with her dog. <laughs> giving her lots of kids. Um, but fill out that general scholarship application if you haven't already. Um, March the 1st is our deadline for that. So this section of scholarships is for our honors and leadership scholarships. And so these are our like big dollar amounts that you can see here. And so each of these scholarships um, is going to also put you in as part of a program when you're here at NSU. So the top three scholarships is Baccalaureate Academic and Northeastern Honors. If you get one of these scholarships, you'll be part of our honors program at NSU. And then the bottom one, the President's Leadership class is also um, a program of its own. So these scholarship applications are due February 1st. Um, they are a little bit more involved than our general um, freshman scholarship application because they are going to require um, some recommendation forms to be filled out for you from either a high school counselor, some teachers, um, maybe community members that are familiar with um, uh, like volunteer things that you've done or something like that for our PLC scholarship. So, 
um, for those, make sure that you're not waiting till the last minute. Um, winter break is a great time to work on these things because they'll have um, some essays and short answer questions and we'll wanna know a little bit more about things you've been involved in. So it does take a little bit of time to go through these applications. Um, when you are, well, I thought my next slide was gonna show me, but um, when you are looking at the application itself, there are a couple of different parts of it. So there's the application itself, there's another form that you will fill out to actually put in your recommender information. And then there's a helpful hints thing that you should read before you start. And all I think a couple of slides in, it's gonna show me that. And so I'll show you that in just a second. Um, but again, when you're looking at this information, we've got to have the test score, we've got to have the GPA that you've met. And then again, these big dollar amounts are every year for four years. So when I was talking earlier about tuition waivers, um, there are different parts of this scholarship. So part of it is a tuition waiver, part of it is a waiver for living on campus. It'll go directly towards your room. And then part of it is called a stipend, which is basically like a cash portion of the scholarship. So once your tuition waiver applies to your tuition and your housing waiver applies to your housing, then you've got this other portion that can help pay for your fees or your books or your meal plan or anything like that. So again, this is just a couple little helpful pieces of information for scholarships. You can find all of our scholarship information right here on our website scholarships.nsuok.edu. And we're recording this session too, and we're gonna post it online. So you can come back um, to this information later and find all of this stuff too, if you're not getting it down tonight as we're going through it. Um, again, a reminder that we already talked about, you've gotta be admitted to NSU before we can award you a scholarship. Because remember, we'll share, I'll share the transcript and, and test score information with the admissions office. Um, we are going to take your highest um, composite ACT score. And so again, these were our deadlines. If you missed our early freshman deadline of December 1st, you've still got time to get it in by our March 1st general deadline. And then again, February 1st is the deadline for our honors and leadership scholarships. Um, I am going to skip this slide because neither one of you are from out of state, I don't think. And then this was just our link here. I am gonna actually pull up this website real quick. Is that pulling up the website? Okay, perfect. So this is just what our, the homepage of the scholarship website looks like. So I, this is like lots and lots of words here, I know. Um, but all of these, when you see it's green, it'll actually link you to some more information. This menu over here on the left is gonna take you to all the important places. So. I'm going to click on incoming freshmen. So we actually did a whole um, virtual website just on scholarships. So you can watch that if you want to. That'll tell you a little bit more about those programs. And so then as we scroll down this page, this has got all the links to all the applications you're going to need. So when I was telling you about honors and PLC, you have some different things you need to look at. This first thing, this helpful hints, read it. It's a document that's gonna tell you step-by-step step every single thing that you need to know for your honors and PLC application. Um, there's a separate one for PLC, but same, same idea. Um, this form is just to enter the information that you need for your recommenders. Remember I said there's some extra pieces to these scholarships. And then this last button is going to be for your actual application. So I just wanted you all to be able to see um, kind of what you're looking for when you go to the application itself. Let's see if I can get back to our PowerPoint here easily. How about that? All right, am I back to my website list? Perfect. Okay. Um, so just a quick little thing to do when you're on your break from school um, is to remember to apply for admission if you haven't done that yet. Um, your counselor can help you submit your transcript and your ACT scores work on all your scholarship applications, um, get your reference form submitted, don't wait till the last minute um, and make your references, fill out something in 10 minutes before it's due. It's not gonna be a very good reference if you wait till the last minute. So give them some time to do that. 
um, one of the other things that I didn't mention on our scholarship application, when I talked a little bit about um, our foundation scholarships that are from private donors, many of those um, scholarships are for Native American students. So on our application, we do ask um, for you to submit a copy of your CDIB card if, if that applies to you. And then here's just our contact information. So super easy, just scholarships at nacok.edu and our phone number there. Um, so if you ever have any questions as you're going through the process, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we want you to fill out your application. We wanna get you um, as much scholarship opportunity as we can. We don't want you to miss out on anything because you're having problems with the process. Um, do either of you have any scholarship questions before we move on with some more info? No. Okay, perfect. Again, just put it in the chat or something as we go along if you think of something. Um, next, we are going to have Ricardo talk about just a little bit about some NSU information in general. So I'll let Ricardo introduce himself to you. Yes, awesome, awesome. Well, good evening, guys. My name is Ricardo Oropeza, and I'm one of the university reps at NSU. So basically, um, my job is pretty much to talk to you guys about the opportunities that we have to offer at NSU as senior slash incoming freshmen. Um, have any of you been to the NSU campuses at all, to any of them? Um, I've been to the one in Tahlequah a couple of times on like school field trips and stuff. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, me too. Cool, cool. So at least uh, you guys are familiar with the campus, which is really, really good. So I'm going to pretty much give you an overview of pretty much everything we have to offer, everything about NSU, just kind of so you have all the information necessary as well. Um, so the first slide here is where did we begin? It's pretty much a history lesson here. We started in 1846 as the Cherokee National Female Seminary. We were located in Park Hill, Oklahoma, which is on the outskirts of Tahlequah. Um, and it was there as an institution until 1887 when it burned down on Easter Sunday. Um, fortunately, in 1889, they decided to rebuild um, the Cherokee National Female Seminary to Tahlequah, and they reopened it that year um, to where we are today. In 1909, um, we bought it, the state of Oklahoma bought the Cherokee National Female Seminary, and we became Northeastern State College. And since then, um, we have been pretty much NSU. We are the oldest university in the state of Oklahoma. So fun fact. <laughs> a little bit about our campuses. We have Tahlequah, Muskogee, and Broken Arrow. So the Broken Arrow campus is specifically for juniors and seniors in college who may not be traditional students, may be working adults living in the Tulsa area, maybe students who want to just do classes in the evenings once a week. Um, it's specifically for that demographic of students. You will not find really your basic English Comp 1 class there, or college algebra class there. It's specifically for those higher concentrated classes for someone who's almost done with their bachelor's degree. The Muskogee campus is specifically for the allied health uh, programs. So if you're interested in nursing, speech language pathology, OT, PA, all of those degrees and their classes, most of them will be held on the Muskogee campus. And then the NSU Tahlequah one, that is our main campus, that's the largest campus, that's where we have all of our sporting events, our student organization events, or most of them, um, pretty much all your classes will be there. I'm most of, if not all of your classes will be there. I know for sure your basic classes will be there, such as your college algebra, English, science classes will be all held there. Um, you guys have already came to NSU Tonic was, so I won't do a plug list. Uh, I won't plug in the campus tour thing, but if you want to come, you should come check out our campus. It's really pretty and I enjoy walking in. A few statistics about NSU. We are the fourth largest university in Oklahoma, so we're not as big as OU or OSU, but we are bigger than universities like TU. We're usually like mid-sized with UCO. 85% um, of our classes have less than 30 students and we have about 7,500 students total. Um, it fluctuates, give or take on all three campuses. Um, what I tell students personally, I graduated from NSU this past May. So a big decision factor as to why I came here was the size. Um, I really enjoyed it because it was the perfect middle ground where we had small class sizes, but also large campus life. So I kind of got the best of those 
best of both worlds in that sense. So I really, really liked having everything like within close proximity, but not meaning that there's like nothing to do. There's always something going on. We get emails every single day about something um, with student life and student organization. So definitely something that keeps the town vibrant and bright and going every single day. So it was something that I really appreciated. We're also named one of the top 40 safest college campuses in the nation. So definitely um, we have a really awesome campus PD who are very helpful. Um, they have really awesome resources and technology such as emergency alert systems and whatnot. Personally, myself, I locked myself out of my car and they helped me and they're super nice about it and very helpful. So I have nothing but good things to say about them. And then lastly, we're ranked 25th most attractive yet affordable college campus in the US. As you guys have been to the NSU Tahlequah, it's very, very pretty. And I stress to students when I go on visits, the affordability is great here. We're the fourth lowest in tuition um, out of all universities in the state of Oklahoma. So as I mentioned before, um, we have a lot of student life here on campus. Um, we have over a hundred student organizations, anything from Greek life to English club to d, d club to the pancake club. There's always something for everyone. Um, and if you have something, if there's something on that list that you cannot find, you can always create your own student organization. So there's multiple opportunities for you to be involved and to find that like a close knit group of friends. That's where I found mine. Um, college is completely different from high school in that sense. It's a really awesome experience when you get involved in getting to meet different organizations and people. So I stress to students that getting involved definitely helps a lot within your college career and it definitely changes your perspective on college. So I stress that. Um, we also have a lot of community service and philanthropy events. So if you want to do community service, if you wanna boost that resume and your profile, if you're wanting to do med school, we offer a lot of days of community service throughout the year that we contribute to the city of Tahlequah. Additionally, we have 20 plus intramural activities. So that's basically sports or athletics, but internally to NSU, you don't compete or go on a division team or anything. It's basically where a group of people um, want to play a specific sport and you get, they will do, they will do tournaments throughout the entire year of that sport or that semester. Um, it's a great way to stay active, to meet people with similar interests, and again, um, it's that involvement that really helps a lot. You get to meet a lot of people as you go throughout your college career. Um, RBC is another program that we have, which we'll talk about in a little bit more in depth, um, but it's pretty much a two-day extended orientation camp um, about three weeks before your freshman year of college starts. That's where you will go camping with current students at NSU. You'll learn about NSU traditions. You will go float the river. You'll learn how to be a successful student, get, insight from current students who are almost done with college or they're on their third year, second year, just basic tips for you to succeed. It's a great way to socialize, but also it's a great way for you to have an easier first day of college. That's what I stress a lot too. Additionally, we have Greek life. So if you're interested in joining a fraternity or sorority, we have three sororities and six fraternities. We also have the Northeastern Activities Board. So this is a student organization that puts on events um, on campus. So they will put stuff such as movies at the park or they will rent out the movie theater or they will do NSU mic night or they will put any type of event for students to attend. So if you're interested in doing that, it's a, again, another great way to get involved and to meet people with those similar interests. This is probably um, one of my favorite parts of the presentation and all those three pictures are mine actually, <laughs> but uh, Riverhawk study abroad. So if you are interested in going to study abroad or to travel the world temporarily, I think um, college is the perfect time to do so. I know times are kind of different right now, um, but in a normal uh, setting, I highly stress that. Um, personally, I was able to go study abroad my junior year. I was in Belgium and I was able to travel a little bit through Europe and it was nothing but an amazing experience. And it was all thanks to the opportunities that I got from NSU. Um, we have two main programs where we do study abroad. One, it's a faculty led study abroad program where you will go for a week or two weeks, something more short term with a professor. You will go to that foreign country, get that full immersion experience and you come back. 
And then we have ICEP, which stands for International Student Exchange Program, where the student individually will go abroad for a semester or a year, stay in that foreign country. Um, but the awesome thing about ICEP is that you would only pay NSU tuition rate, which is really, really awesome because we are very affordable. And in foreign countries, college is probably a lot more expensive too. So it's definitely um, a great way to go abroad and pretty much pay your NSU bill, but in that foreign country. So I definitely stress to people to go abroad if you have the opportunity to do so. We have great programs and we have partnerships in over 50 countries. Also one of my favorite parts of the presentation is the heart of the Cherokee Nation. So we are the number one four year college serving Native Americans, um, NSU Tahlequah. So Tahlequah is the capital of Cherokee Nation. So we have a lot of influence um, when it comes to diversity and culture on our campus in our city. So we definitely are very proud of all the Native American students we serve. Um, we, graduate we graduate the most Native American students in the United States. Um, so there's multiple things to do, not just at NSU, but also Tahlequah because of the Cherokee Nation. Um, again, that big influence that we have on our campus and our city definitely brightens the town as well. If you guys are interested in doing sports and playing for a division, we have uh, we're a part of the NCAA Division II sports team. So we have 10 different sports. Um, anything from football, basketball, soccer, baseball, softball, golf, tennis. We have all these sports and most of them are offered in a men's and women's team. Um, the really cool thing about, uh, you know, the really cool thing of joining a Riverhawk athletics team is that you get to play in your college career. But if you're not interested in playing sports, the cool thing about that is that you get free admission to all the home games. I really enjoyed going to football games to basketball games and soccer games. I get very heated with basketball games <laughs> to be completely honest, but it's super, super fun. Um, and also when you go, when it's football season, we have tailgating opportunities, which is basically all student organizations will set up tents, have free food, put out games and stuff right next to the stadium about two hours before the game starts. You watch the spirit teams perform, you watch, uh, you get to hear the band. It's a great way to socialize. And when I was a freshman, free food, that sold me really, really quickly to go tailgating. So it was a really fun opportunity. Academically speaking, we have about 60 undergraduate programs or 60 different majors. Um, we have anything from accounting to education to history, drama, English, applied physics, mathematics, um, et cetera, you name it. We have a wide variety of degrees at NSU. I tell students, you do not need to declare anything your freshman year. Um, it's a perfect time for you to kind of test out the waters and whatnot and see what you like or what you don't like. But um, if you do know what you wanna do, that's great. Um, we have a lot to offer. So definitely something for you guys to check out. Additionally, we have 24 graduate programs. So 24 master's degrees. So if you're interested in doing a master's program. We do offer a lot of those at NSU as well. And then lastly, we have one optometry program, which is our only doctoral program. Um, the NSU College of Optometry is the only one in the state of Oklahoma and one of 23 in the United States. So if you're interested in becoming an eye doctor, this is a great program, very prestigious, very um, something the Riverhawks are very proud of. Um, they have a very small class size that they take every year but they love seeing NSU undergrad applications. They have a lot of people apply from all across the country. So if you're interested in becoming an eye doctor, I may give you some business because you know, I'm wearing glasses. <laughs> so I'm going to touch up on admission requirements. Jess was just talking about it a little bit. Um, so we have three different options to be admitted to NSU. Option one is having a 20 on your ACT or a 1030 on your or SAT. So either one of those, if you meet that requirement, you're automatically admitted to NSU. Option two is having a 2.7 GPA and being in the top 50% of your senior class. Or option three, having a 2.7 GPA in your core classes. Those are your English, math, science classes that you took in high school need to all add up to a cumulative 2.7 minimum. So as Jess was stating, Options two and three do not require a minimum ACT, but we still need to have them in order to move forward with your application. So 
make sure you take the ACT um, and send those scores to us, even if you're wanting to get in through options two or three. Um, before we move on to the last thing, I like to tell people, so I am a pretty much, my parents did not go to school in the United States, so I'm technically a first generation student. Um, because I had no idea how to college, basically, my senior year, no idea at all. Um, one thing I tell people who are first generation students, ask all the questions, um, reach out to us, even if you think that person's not the person that can help you, they will connect you with someone. I am a university representative and I can put all my information in the chat too for you to contact me with any questions, um, but asking those questions will definitely get you far. Um, even if you're not sure what you're wanting to do or how to do FAFSA or how to apply for scholarships, like I get that feeling of like your parents not knowing exactly what's going on. But if you ask those questions, it really will make a difference and it will help you go a long way. Um, so yeah, don't feel um, embarrassed or don't feel like you can't ask the questions or it's a dumb question. That is what we're here for. Um, but yeah, that was like the last part that I was gonna say, but thank you guys. I like Ricardo said, we are all here to answer all the questions. And sometimes you don't even know what your question is. Um, and that's hard to, to start out sometimes. But, you know, if, if, if there's anything you need or you just don't even know where to start, um, please just ask any one of us. Um, the next section of stuff is just some things um, to keep in mind over the summer. So after you graduate from high school and before you start here in the fall, there are some different things that um, some of them you need to do and some of them are optional that are still good things to do. So the very first thing that you'll need to do um, is enroll. Um, so if you're admitted, you know you want to come here in the fall, you've got to get enrolled in some classes, right? So SOAR, um, our student orientation, advising and registration is what we call it. Um, SOAR for short is when you will actually enroll in your classes. Um, so we are planning to hopefully invite students to come on campus um, next summer. Last summer, we had to do it all virtually. Um, we hope that we're gonna be able to um, do these in person this coming summer. Um, but you can already sign up for dates. It, once you get admitted, you can sign up for one of these enrollment sessions. They'll start in May and go all the way through to August. Um, the earlier that you sign up and come on campus, the more um, opportunity you'll have, um, the, the bigger selection of classes you are gonna have. So you don't want to wait until the last minute. If you know NSU is where you wanna go, sign up for one of those earlier sessions so you can have the biggest selection of classes. Um, We've got um, any variety of online classes, in-person classes. Um, we have classes kind of like this, where you would log on to Zoom at a certain time of day for your class, but you're actually doing it via Zoom instead of coming to the classroom. So we've got all of those versions of different types of classes. Um, so you can find something that's going to work for you. But like I said, the earlier you sign up, the more selection that you're going to have. Um, the Summer Bridge Program is something that we just started last summer and we will have that again this summer. Um, for students that have um, maybe not scored very high on the ACT or maybe you've got a subject area um, that you scored kind of low in that you need some more help with, say um, math is usually one that maybe students might need some extra help with, um, but also um, reading and English. Um, this program is to help students if you are going to have to um, take a zero level or remedial class, um, this is something that would help you test out of that. So when you have to take a zero level course that doesn't, those hours that you're enrolled in don't actually count towards the hours you need to graduate. Um, so this would help you um, take have a little bit of extra help during the summer um, to be able to retest in those classes to try to test into an actual credit bearing course your first semester. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, um, we can definitely get you some more information. You can look at that on our website um, and sign up for that. So in June, the session will be hosted virtually. So again, over Zoom. And then in July, you would be able to actually come on campus and stay in um, our residence halls and actually be on campus during the summer. 
Um, Rookie Bridge Camp, Ricardo talked about a little bit earlier, but this is a two-day um, orientation session where, again, you'll come and stay. Um, last, last summer, students stayed on campus. Um, in the normal non-COVID world, you actually go off campus and stay um, in a place by the river, like in um, like camps, kind of. Um, but this, again, is an opportunity for you to meet other incoming students like yourself. Uh, and, and get to know them before classes start in the fall. So there are usually two different sessions of two-day camps, and they'll happen at the beginning of August before classes actually start. So the whole thing is run by upperclassmen. Um, it's all student-led and student-planned. Um, so it is, it's a lot, a lot of fun. The students that are doing it are volunteers, and they love it and NSU so much that they're volunteering their time to do this just for you all. Um, Welcome Week is another um, required event, um, but also something that is um, an incredible learning experience that's going to get you set for um, your first weeks in school. So this is actually part of your college strategies class, which is your orientation class. Um, Welcome Week uh, counts for like 50% of your grade. So just by coming to Welcome Week, um, you're getting a lot of the requirements done for your class. Uh, again, you will meet um, all week with the class that you will have throughout the semester. So you're going to get to know those students really well um, and have all the opportunity to learn all kinds of information that you need to know before you're actually starting um, your classes the first week of school. Again, this is the week right before classes start. So this is just some stuff that I wanted to share with you. I found this article over the last week and I read it and I thought it was really, really interesting and it helped me kind of like pinpoint some things that are hard to describe sometimes. So um, I don't know if you all are going virtually or in person to your high school classes right now um, or likely a mixture of both because it seems like schools are kind of going back and forth. Um, I know at Tahlequah High School they have had a couple of weeks where they've had all virtual learning and they kind of go back and forth so um, sometimes it's really difficult to know like why you might be having trouble with virtual classes and even myself when I have to work from home sometimes I'm like, why, why is this miserable? I don't know. <laughs> um, but sometimes it's just really hard to connect with people um, when this, this is your interaction with them, that you don't have that in-person face-to-face thing. And so this, to me, when I read the article and the, the um, link is at the bottom, and like I said, we're going to share this, but these were the points um, that the article showed of um, why sometimes it's difficult and, and hard to connect with people. So you are, um, you know, you may be feeling like you're disconnected from your friends, um, that you don't get to just have those little conversations with them when you see them in the hallways and, and things like that. Um, like for me, if I'm in a meeting, like it's easy to just talk to the person next to you if you have some comment to make or something like that. By the time you unmute yourself, or unhide yourself from the camera or something, the moment is past, like it's gone. You feel like you don't want to take the time to stop the conversation and make these comments and have these interactions with people um, that it's just difficult to do. And so, um, but a lot of these things, you can read through them there and I won't go through them all. Um, but to me, this helped put like some actual words with like, okay, this is why I feel this way. And like I said, um, the classes that NSU offers, we've got the, like a traditional on traditional, but your typical online class where you're never going to be in a classroom setting, you're just doing all the information yourself and getting your assignments um, from an online, um, we call it Blackboard, but um, like an online place where you're just getting all of your assignments and turning them in without having any class interaction. We have actual in-person regular classes that are face-to-face -face, and then we've kind of got these virtual classes. So you all know yourselves best and what's going to work for you. Um, but again, we all are feeling these struggles and things as we're trying to figure out this new way of learning and interacting with each other. Um, and so to me, it helped to read through these things and actually think other people feel this way too, you know, like when you're at home, um, this, I thought this was interesting too, like the sense of privacy at home, like you're at home. Of course you have all the privacy in the world, but sometimes you don't, if you've got 
brothers and sisters that are also trying to have classes online, if your parents are having to work at home, like there's always somebody around um, and you may not be able to have those um, conversations that you need to, like maybe you are struggling with a class, but you can't find that time to talk to your teacher to ask for help. Or if you're having problems at home and you wanna to talk to that friend about something that's happening at home and you don't have that um, privacy to talk about that too, it can be really hard. So. Um, we just want to say we understand um, and fill those things too. So don't, I mean, these are all, these are all questions and struggles and things that you need to find out. And so, um, you know, like you can still live on campus and take online classes. Sometimes um, maybe your internet's not very reliable at home, or maybe you don't have internet at home and you think, how in the world am I going to do these classes um, if I don't have internet? I mean, that's a, that's a concern, you know, sometimes it's not that great. So you can, you can live on campus and have that community feeling, even if you are not going to class every day. Um, it is a hard decision to make sometimes to decide to move on campus during all of this stuff that's so unknown. Um, but NSU has been great about taking a lot of precautions um, to keep our students safe um, keep our buildings and classrooms and dormitories sanitized and, and make sure that everyone is well taken care of. So um, it is, you know, it's a proven fact that students that live on campus do a lot better because they are able to communicate with their peers and um, be involved in things and you're on campus for those events. So you're already here. So I just wanted to take a moment and talk about that stuff with you guys. So Tracy has been here with us the whole time. Um, and so we wanted to take some time um, for you all to ask questions. Tracy is a current student right now. She's a graduate student, um, but was um, did earn her degree here as an um, undergraduate student. Um, and so did um, Ricardo just graduated in May. I graduated from NSU a while ago, but um, we would just like to take a minute to um, answer any questions about anything you all need to know. So um, I'll just throw a few things out there to maybe get a conversation going. Um, kind of touched on it, Jessica did a few minutes ago talking about living on campus. Um, I'm a huge proponent for for students living on campus. There is um, scientific data that backs the success rates of students who live on campus, especially that first year and succeed through college. Um, and also if you complete three semesters of college, you are 86 or 83% more likely to graduate. So stick it out through three at least, then you're so much more likely to finish. Um, I actually started my undergrad in the 90s when I graduated high school many years ago um, and then stopped and had a son and then came back um, as a non-traditional student, but I was the first in my family to graduate. Um, so whenever I started getting closer, even, at, even in my 40s, there was a lot of pressure to finish. Um, so you may feel that being maybe a first gen student. I don't know if Ricardo felt that way. But for me, it was a little bit tough. Like I'm in my 40s and, you know, I have a son that was actually in college at the same time. Um, so there's, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, it, it was such a big deal to my family for me to finish, even though I was so much older. And I didn't realize it until I got closer whenever they were asking me, so you are finishing, right? Like you're going to graduate soon, right? Um, it was just, every time I was with my family, it was always about when, are my, when am I graduating? And I'm like, I need you guys to slow your roll because I have to slow mine because I'm not brilliant. <laughs> I have an old brain, so I can only take X amount of hours at a time. Um, but there's definitely a different pressure being a first generation college student. So there are some really great organizations on campus to help you through that though. There is actually literally a club called the First Generation College Student Club. And then there's also TRIO, which helps first generation students. Um, you qualify by being first generation by economic um, an economic consideration is also in there. Um, and there's a third one, I never can remember what it is, but um, they have their own labs, they have their own tutors, they will help you with graduate school applications. And sometimes you just feel a little bit of burnt out. 
feeling um, with all that pressure that comes with it, they take you off campus to do different um, activities and kind of get you out of that environment where you feel a lot of pressure. So the TRIO is, and it's a national organization, it's not um, strictly an NSU thing. So there's um, a lot of opportunity for you as a first generation student. Do either of you know um, what you want to major in? Have you thought about that at all to have any questions? And, and if not, it's totally fine if you're undecided. Um, I think a lot of times students think they need to know exactly what they want to do when they start school, and that is not the case, because even if you knew, you'd probably change your mind. Um, so I think everyone can talk about, you know, I changed my major um, when I started school. Mo most students do. So there are, every program has a certain number of gen ed, so general education requirements. Everybody's got to take English. Everybody's got to take history. There are plenty of classes that you have to take that are going to count for every single major. Um, and it's also that time to take some intro classes like intro to psychology, intro to business, whatever. So you can kind of um, see what it is that interests you once you get here. Um, so we'd be happy to answer any questions that you've got about programs, majors, anything like that. I thought I had it all put together my senior year and I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to get my degree in. Uh, at the end of my freshman year, I ended up changing my major to something that I enjoy way more. Um, so moral of the story, it's totally fine not knowing what you want to do and it's totally fine to switch your major as well. Um, everyone is capable of getting that degree and going to college. Um, but like Jessica said, you know, it's that freshman year is the perfect time to you to test out the waters and see what do you like, what you don't like. Um, and there's multiple opportunities here for you to figure that out. Um, I know at the moment I'm wanting to major in psychology and then go back to college in a couple of years after I graduate and go minor in criminal justice and go out for the FBI. That's awesome. It's really awesome. Yeah, and you can definitely when you're here, like you can take intro to criminal justice and see see about that. I mean, you can um, you'll usually have a major and a minor, um, so you can work on those criminal justice classes at the same time. Um, even if you're thinking about getting a master's degree, um, there are some programs now that have an accelerated degree program. So once you get to your junior and senior year. Um, and you've decided a little bit more about exactly what you want to do, there are some programs where you can actually start a master's degree at the same time that you're finishing your undergraduate degree. So not to like overwhelm you all with all that stuff, but um, there's just a lot of different opportunities once you get here and kind of figure out the path that you're on. Um, there, there's just a lot of different things that you can do once you get to that point. So, um, but that's a great goal. That's awesome. Thank you. So does anybody else have any other things? That, are there some things that we maybe didn't talk about tonight that um, you had questions about that you thought you'd learn about? And if not, that's okay. Maybe we covered everything and more than you would ever possibly <laughs> want to know in this hour, right? <laughs> Um, I am going to share my screen one more time because um, I've got some um, dates coming up in the spring semester that I want to share with you. So let me get the screen back. All right. So this is just a kind of a recap of some of the dates that we talked about earlier. Um, the FAFSA is already open like we talked about. So make sure to fill out your FAFSA, your application for financial aid. Um, if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and do that. Um, again, our um, scholarship deadlines are coming up February 1st and March 1st. And then we've got some events on campus in the spring too. So if you guys want to come back to campus um, to an event where you can um, learn some more information about NSU, um, visit with some faculty and some programs, some student organizations, uh, and do that kind of thing February 13th. Uh, is a Saturday. You can bring one guest with you. Um, the registration is not open for that yet, but will be in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, March the 6th is Riverhawk Hype. And so that is just for students that have been admitted to NSU for next fall. So if you haven't been admitted yet, um, get admitted and come to this date because it's going to be super fun. Um, you'll get a lot of good information, some cool stuff, and it's really just a celebration um, of, of you uh, that we're excited that it's your senior year, that you're planning to come to NSU, even if you're undecided and you're admitted come join us because um, it's going to be a great day. And then neither one of you are juniors, but if you have any friends that are juniors, um, younger siblings or cousins or something like that, April 7th will be a day um, just for juniors on our campus. So um, that's all the information that we had to share with you all tonight. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, you're, you can feel free to log off, but please um, contact us if there's anything at all that we can do for you um, throughout the process of, of figuring out what you want to do with your lives. <laughs> um, we will do our best to help you in any way that we can. All right, I'm going to stop sharing this and then we will sign off. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We're really happy that you're here tonight. Hope you got a lot of good information. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Well, <laughs> I was going.